Hello, this is Vincent and welcome to Dogma Discussions. In this channel I discuss mostly religious dogma, but all kinds of dogma. My experience uh, is what these uh, videos are, are based on, and that's from the evangelical religion. But I weave in other information. So they are somewhat anecdotal and also informational. And People generally find that uh, they're relatable to their own experiences in <clears throat> a lot of different religions. So, um, if you like the videos, please hit the like button, subscribe, choose a notification bell so you know when I put out new videos, and share with other people. Uh, the one for today um, is just about the usefulness of Scripture. What, what's it useful for? Here we go. In 2 Timothy, the author makes a bold statement that all Scripture is useful for teaching, reproof, and correction. That's quite a claim. Is it true? Well, it depends on your perspective. If you're a religious person, you may very well agree. Many do, especially those in leadership. Yet, what does a skeptic like I find when turning to the Bible for guidance? That the purpose of the good book is to exert God's authoritarianism over believers while training them to be helpless and docile. As a result, the religious community is strengthened by indoctrinating, shaming, and training the faithful to act against their own interests. To me, teaching involves helping people think critically so that they can apply knowledge in their daily lives. That's the idea behind teaching a man to fish versus merely giving him food. In this sense, teaching is granting a person self-sufficiency. Yet, is that what the Bible does? Consider the following example. Judge not so that you are not judged. On first glance, it seems like good advice to not judge, except that the quote-unquote advice is couched with a warning, or more accurately, a threat. What if, instead of that approach, Jesus explained clearly what judging is and how it causes harm? In other words, it would help us be self-sufficient rather than mindless drones. So, why doesn't he? In order to answer that question, let's consider the context of this verse. The chapter is replete with other ill-defined sayings, such as, Don't throw pearls to swine. Seek, and you will find. Do unto others. Watch out for false prophets, etc. And you may fairly ask, How do all these quotes fit together? The answer becomes clear in the final verses. That when Jesus finished speaking, onlookers were amazed because he taught like a person with authority. And that's the point. Those who trust in Scripture to guide their lives are not being taught to think for themselves. They're being indoctrinated to recognize the authority of the Bible and memorize its verses. For example, the Scripture says not to judge. Yet, how does one know if he or she is judging? Since judging is not defined and doesn't teach the flock to analyze and solve problems, it behooves us to look to the church for guidance. This serves two purposes. It keeps the community together and the flock dependent. Reproof, unlike teaching, is not a word we often hear, yet it means an expression of disapproval. Like when you're a child and your parent says your name in a certain manner or casts a specific look in your direction and you shrink away in shame. 
I'm presuming that Jesus' disciples felt similarly when they were reproved by their Lord. According to Luke, a man approached the Son of God to cast out a demon from his own son, a request he says the disciples were unable to fulfill. After Jesus completes the task, the scripture tells us that everyone is amazed at God's greatness. Jesus then rebukes his disciples for their lack of faith. So, what is the lesson here? The incompetence of Jesus' elite circle contrasted with their Lord's success? Yes, it clearly demonstrates that humans are limited, inferior, even blessed individuals like the apostles. How different the message would have been if Jesus had taken the opportunity to train the disciples to overcome this failure and be successful in the future. That would also demonstrate to the faithful that they could be that powerful too, like God. But wait, Paul tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, meaning we humans are irreparably flawed, which this story clearly illustrates. Think about it. How special would the Son of God be if ordinary humans could be taught the same healing tricks? Not very. Thus, this example is designed to raise the Savior up by pushing his followers down, thereby demonstrating God's authority and superiority and humans' helplessness. Working through this scripture, I am reminded of a time I experienced a harsh reproof. I was in my 20s, and while attending an evangelical congregation, I worked briefly for one of the church leaders. He had a small business in which he did construction and restoration work. In general, he was a fair boss and kept me busy. One day, We were roofing a small shed we had built in someone's backyard. Let me take you to that moment. We had taken a lunch break and were returning to hammering plywood into place, which the shingles would cover. Having just been in my car only moments before, listening to the radio while I was eating, one of the songs I had heard now pops into my mind. It's John Mellencamp's authority song. So the chorus lightheartedly drifts through my lips while working. I fight authority, authority always wins. Well, I fight authority, authority always wins. Well, I've been doing it since I was a young kid and I come out grinning. Well, I fight authority, authority always wins. Jonathan stops hammering and looks at me, which causes me to pause working and singing. You know, Vincent, I've noticed something about you. Really? What? Well, it's in the song you were just singing. What song, I ask, since I had been absentmindedly crooning. That song about fighting authority. That's your problem. Have I not done what you've wanted me to do, Jonathan? No, you're a good worker. It's not that. It's your attitude towards God. You're always questioning everything instead of just being obedient. I say nothing and we return to hammering. But after that, I find other odd jobs and make myself unavailable. Why? Can I trust someone who takes an innocent moment and uses it to shame me? Like the example of Jesus and his disciples, reproof is about subjugating, not helping. And what about correction? How does it differ from reproof? Correction involves actually changing the way you think by which your behavior is altered, not just shaming you into obedience. 
Consider Luke when he says that no one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or are devoted to one and despise the other. The message is to live your life for the Almighty and not the world. We see some religions who priestly class does this, taking a vow of poverty in order to focus completely on God. While that may work for those in such a privileged position, what about the average person? How do we be in the world, but not of it, as Jesus says? Or does he actually say that? Well, sort of. In John, Jesus actually says that the world hates Christians because he pulled you out of the world. That if you were of the world, you would be loved by it. Irregardless, when I hear these verses, I think about what constitutes the world. Sex, food, drink, as well as money, which helps us have access to many quote-unquote pleasures of the flesh, including vacations, exercise, movies, and other media, reading, and a variety of other activities. Since we are biological beings, it would seem natural to seek to fulfill our physical and emotional needs in a reasonable manner, of course. Yet, religion often promotes denying the flesh, even punishing it. Why pay for gym memberships or travel or dinners out when you can use that money to support the church? Why engage in consensual sex for pleasure when you can let your church influence when and with whom to enjoy intimacy, as well as how and in what positions to have those conjugal relations? Why not let the church decide if you can drink or not and what should be a priority in your life? In short, the church trains you to comply to its interests rather than your own. It's natural for human beings to seek to meet their own needs and those of their family, tribe, clan, whatever. Yet the dogma of correction seeks to alter that natural inclination. If you've read Homer's Odyssey, you'll remember the land of the lotus eaters. For those who haven't, Odysseus and his men dock on a shore where people eat lotus plants all day long. The effect of the plant is to make a person docile, and its lure so powerful that Odysseus has to drag his men back to the ship, kicking and screaming. Religious dogma is the lotus plant. It trains us to wonder what the Bible would want us to do instead of committing ourselves to liberté, égalité, fraternité, and treating our fellow creatures decently. Rather than relying on Scripture for moral guidance, a better model might be Kant's ethics, in which everyone should act according to the same rules, which are rooted in the idea of respecting the humanity in each individual. Yet, what's the message given by the church? That the world of humans doesn't deserve respect. It's evil. Rather, be godly, devoted, give. Listen to your ministers. This trains a dependent and docile flock, nourished by the lotus of Scripture. Okay, everyone, that is my story for this time. I thank you for listening. Please hit the like button, subscribe, put me a comment, let me know what you think. If you disagree, that's okay. We can talk about it. Have a good day, evening, whatever it is where you are. Until next time, this is Vincent. Goodbye.